Hi, I'm Jonathan McHugh. Welcome to the Business of Film Music, Kogod American University. We're coming to you live tonight from Universal Studios. That's right, Hollywood, California, in the office of Mike Knobloch, the special conference room, shall I say. Uh, Mike Knobloch is the president of Film Music and Publishing at Universal Pictures, and hell of a nice guy. Uh, he came up through the ranks of 20th Century Fox, 14 years there, and he rose to the position here five years ago. And he has been making an impact. The company is on a huge roll, and they have reached five billion dollars this year alone, if you can believe that, in all the films that everything from Minions to Jurassic Park to Fast and Furious 7. Uh, tremendous role, a lot of music films, number one soundtracks. Um, they published the song Happy from Pharrell, which was from their movie. So uh, Mike came up through uh, Fox and has been here five years, as I said. Um, so we're gonna talk to him tonight about what he did, does and how he does it and where he came up. So. Um, Get ready for Mike Knobloch. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Knobloch, president of music at Universal Pictures. Hi, guys. Is that the right title? President of film music and publishing at Universal Pictures. And publishing. Yeah. That's where Alexa Baum comes in play. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, I've known Mike for a long time. And what, what I really want to start, there's so much to talk about because of this incredible, incredible year uh, and, and um, just what they put on the board. But I really want to start at the beginning because I think that's really the most important thing backtrack um, from how did you get in the business, where did you start, how did it all mm. begin? Oh my God, how much time do you guys have? It's already late on the East Coast, no, so I time. don't know. They're here, man, that's what they're here. They're here to sponge it up. <laughs> um, I guess the short, hi, by the way, nice to meet all of you. Thanks for staying up late. Um, it's a very bizarre dynamic we have yeah, going yeah, we here. Two where cameras you're, going, on, so. you're on a screen, but I'm looking at you over there. So, hi. Um, I grew up in New York. I had no connection to show business. I, you know, there was probably a point in my life where I thought I would, you know, being a rock star for a living was probably a good sort of chosen profession. Mm -hmm. um, I played in bands as a kid. I, I don't think I was... What instrument? Keyboards and drums. Um, and, um, you know, mostly like self-taught and, and uh, played in bands in high school and college. I went to Northwestern, so I left New York and went to, the, to uh, outside Chicago and ended up being a theater major at Northwestern, which was just a program that was thriving when I was there. And uh, somewhere along the way, um, I mean, I kind of always knew that I, that working in music or being connected to music somehow was, was what was ultimately what I was gonna pursue. I, although I didn't have any connection to the business growing up and I didn't really know a lot about it. And unlike today for, for these guys, um, you know, we didn't have the internet so that makes me an old man, but it also, you know, sort of like we just, you only had the information you had access to through like trade magazines and things like that. Sure. So, um, you know, just getting access, I think, initially early on was the hardest part. But when I was at Northwestern, I had a friend when I was in my junior year, a friend of mine got cast in a movie, a big Hollywood movie. And so I came out to L.A. for the first time ever to visit my friend who was playing the lead in a, in a movie opposite Steve Martin and Diane Keaton. Anybody we know? Um, There's a movie called Father of the Bride. It was a remake of the Spencer Tracy, um, Elizabeth Taylor movie. And, um, and my friend ended up being the bride, the who main, the main character, that? Kimberly Williams. She's now Mrs. Brad Paisley. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, so I came out to visit while the movie was being made, and I ended up getting a job on the movie as a, as a production assistant. And um, that was my entree into learning how the business worked and learning how movies got made. And um, I kind of got bitten by the bug. It was really from that first experience that I learned that there was this intersection of music and film and that people did things like this for a living. And I also learned how specialized the industry is and that there's composers and orchestrators and technical people and executives and record company executives and publishing executives and all the kind of personnel that it takes even just on the music side to just do make one movie or make one soundtrack. And it just, I, that for me was a huge kind of aha moment. It was a huge discovery that this, that this existed and that that was my destination. And um, it was actually a summer job that turned into a longer job and I, I turned it into a school credit kind of. The, that PA, the, PA, the PA job started as a summer thing and then I took fall quarter at Northwestern off, got a school credit for being out here and working on the film and I took some night classes at UCLA rushed back to school in January, graduated in May, and came right back out and kept working for those filmmakers as their assistant. Um, and that was my first job Who after school. Filmmakers? It was uh, uh, Nancy Myers, oh who my just God. 
She intern. Just, yeah, just made the intern. Jesus. And that's a crazy um, place it's to complicated live. and something's got to yeah, give. Huge, and, huge journey. Right? And, but then it, Father of the Bride was her and her then partner, Charles Shire. So that was my first, that was like my boot camp into the business was basically being so like. You really started like myself, actually, the first yeah. time on the, on, the, on the film side, not the music side. I started on the film side, but I did that for a couple of years and then sort of realized I wanted to be more on the music side. And I, through them, I met a guy named Steve Tyrell, who, if you remember the movie Father of the Bride, he's the raspy-voiced crooner who sings The Way You Look Tonight is like the mm -hmm. signature song in Father of the Bride. And I met him from working on the movie, and I hit him up for a job. And he was then, um, in, this is now in the sort of early 90s, he was a music supervisor and songwriter and had a studio in Hollywood, and I went to work for him, being kind of like a jack of all trades. I worked in the studio, I learned how to cut records, I learned more about music supervision. I got to work on a TV show that was shooting in Toronto as the sort of the on-set supervisor. Um, and I, I got to do a little bit of everything there, but I still... And Tyrell was in his heyday there, right? Tyrell was in his heyday, he'd been making hits. He had a big hit song from a TV show called The Heights, which That's was right. a million years ago. And, um, uh, you know, but it was sort of like, in hindsight, what I was doing was I kind of started zigzagging. My new film music was my destination, and I kind of zigzagged my way towards that destination um, because I went from working at Disney for the Meyer Shires to working for Tyrell at his studio, and then I had a next-door neighbor working on a TV show called Channel One News. And I wanted to, like, work on this show. Not really, I didn't want to be in the news business, but I wanted to work on this TV show. And I don't know if any of you guys remember what Channel One News was. Um, it was a daily news show uh, piped into high schools across the country. Channel but one. what was cool about working there at that time is the on-air talent at Channel One News were people like Anderson Cooper and Lisa Ling and Serena Altschul and Tracy Smith. And it was just a very cool group of people. It was a cool time to be there. I just realized at some point I was working in the news business and I kind of got a little off track and never really wanted to work in news. But the one really cool thing that happened to me in the second year that I was working there was I was in somebody's office and they had a copy of The Hollywood Reporter on their coffee table and it was the film and TV music edition of The Hollywood Reporter that they would then do quarterly or biannually mm -hmm. or something like that. And in the middle of, of it was a directory of everybody running a music department or a, a soundtrack label. It was just this great directory of addresses and phone numbers and people and their titles. And it must have been 100 people, probably including the person I replaced here at this gig. <laughs> and I sent a letter to everyone in that directory saying everyone? every single person, probably including the person I replaced wow. here. That's a lot. Um, and um, my girlfriend then, now my wife, um, was uh, was doing graphic design stuff, and she helped the letter look really cool and got really cool paper and cool fancied stationery, it fancied it up so it would stand out on a pile. Mm -hmm. And um, I sent it out maybe to a hundred people, just sort of you know a standard form letter, and I got one response, and it was from a guy named Robert Kraft who was running the music department at 20th Century Fox, and this was in '96, and he um, and he called me in for a meeting, and we met. And he kind of admitted to me at some point later on that he never really read the letter. He just liked the stationery. No and, way. Yeah. So that's a check and, mark for your wife. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and what was cool then was I didn't really have the experience that I claimed to have. I mean, I'd worked on a couple of movies for these filmmakers at Disney. And then I went and worked for, I went and worked for these, this guy in a recording studio. And then I worked on this TV news show. But I was interviewing for a job that really wasn't any of those things. But I kind of bullshitted my way into... You know, so you, how all of those things added up to the skill set that I needed to do the job that he was filling at Fox. And what the and, job was called what? And the job then was Associate Director of Film Music Production. So I was hired at Fox in 96 by Robert Kraft as sort of the um, nuts and bolts technical production guy in the music department to work in conjunction with the creative team then um, to, to, to do what they were doing at Fox. And that's where I started and I was there for 14 years and one of the first movies I worked on was Titanic. Mm. And one of the last movies I worked on at Fox was Avatar. And um, a lot of the ones in between were things like Moulin Rouge and Walk the Line and Drumline and the X-Men movies and the Ice Age movies. But, and but your job changed though, right? Once you yeah, I, so I, job, I, how long did you do that more technical job before you became more on the creative side? I, I'd say within, after, after the first few years, maybe after the first four or five years of really being exclusively like the production, the nuts and bolts kind of how-to guy, I moved more and more into the creative realm um, and ultimately 
you know, after about a decade of being there, worked my way up to EVP of the department, essentially the number two guy in the department with Robert. And then in 2010, got tapped to come here and run the department here at Universal, which is this music department here at this studio, um, which is very similar to, you know, there's six major studios and they all kind of function pretty similarly, but this studio happens to make fantastic movies and the team, the, you know, the woman who hired me runs the studio and she had sort of just started as the boss here when she hired me. And so it's really kind of turned over a bit here, but you know, between the sizzle reel that you guys saw and just the, the other stuff that this company has been doing, they, they, they take a lot of creative risks. They really embrace music driven movies and musicals. Um, just really creative, really filmmaker friendly. And it's just, it's, you know, I'm coming up on six years here wow. now. And um, then it goes so quick. Huh? It goes that that's I just described like basically 25 years of yeah. my life in uh, in, in nine minutes. Yeah. That's so, so that's, so that's that. back to Fox for a second. So you were functioning there. You weren't doing any TV there, right? It was no, all film. film. Right. All working on films. And Robert Kraft is kind of a really interesting character in the in the film music space. He was a songwriter who... Um, Oscar-nominated Oscar songwriter. Oscar-nominated songwriter for... Uh, what was the movie? It was the, For uh, Mambo Kings. Mambo he wrote a song Kings, called right. Beautiful Maria of My Soul. Right, which is a sweet, sweet song. Yeah. But he was one of these great music guys, totally cool. And so, you know, he basically mentored you on the way, all the way up through, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And... Um, and so then, then that gets to a point where, like I said, I love the, your, your zigzagging reference because, again, it's all about them getting in the world and how do they do it. Mm -hmm. So it really took you three jobs yeah. to get to the job you wanted and even that and then 14 years to yeah. get to the spot where you can get to this number one spot in the game. Yeah. So that's a 20-year journey in a way sure. to get here. Sure. But, I mean, coming up on my sixth year here, that's almost going to make exactly two decades of working at a studio in a music department overseeing music for films. And the, in the years leading up to that, I graduated Northwestern in 92, but the, the, the father of the bride thing was in 91. So from 91 to 96, so those five years, the zigzagging was really the kind of the discovery of who does what in the business, how the business works. I mean, if nothing else, if, any of the, if anyone was trying to replicate my path, which is completely unrecreatable, you know, it sort of starts with like have a friend who gets cast in a movie and then go visit the set and then get a job on that movie working for those people. Like there's all, you right. know, but there is a theme of just be someone that people want to have around because you can help get things done and you can help solve problems. Um, but what the benefit for me as I soaked it all up like a sponge was that somewhere along the way, I learned enough to identify, wait a second, film music, that's a thing. And I, it's almost like, it's almost like walking into a room and hearing people speaking a language that's like in your that's programmed into your brain that you didn't even realize right. you spoke, right? right? And then all of a sudden you're fluent in it and you're better at it than anybody and you realize like that's my calling, that's where I want to be, but you know, at the time the only resources I had other than access to those kinds of things there's like Don Passman's book which sure. I'm, I don't know if you've already talked with them no, about, not, but yeah. you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a book that's like the Bible of the music business called Every, Everything You Need to Know about, about the, the music business. business. Yeah. It's on its like 10th printing. Yeah, they, 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 however many editions later. Um, but you know, that book plus the internet gives you guys access to like everything that you could ever know about how specialized the business is and the difference between the creative gigs and the business gigs and the technical gigs and the ones where you're an independent freelancer versus, you know, an employee of a corporation. And, you know, so I learned all of this stuff along the way and just at some point realized I that's this is the environment in which I excel. I under like I know, hopefully after 20 years of doing it, I know how to I know how to do this job of collaborating with studio executives, filmmakers, creative people, composers, songwriters, artists, publishers, record labels, agents, managers, all the people that it takes to kind of come together and make music for movies and soundtracks. So, yeah, that's, yeah and, I, and like I said, my career path, I told them in my first class was interesting that you get to these different places and you take jobs and you're never sure, but you sponge up information and you get to a certain place and then you can move to another thing because you have credibility, which is exactly what you did and described beautifully in the zigzag. Yeah. So let's just take, for example, a day today, for example. So mm -hmm. give us a couple different things that you did today that make up your day that you can talk about that aren't, you know, super top secret. Yeah. Well, we have a big animated movie um, 
for next year that um, is pretty much under wraps. There's nothing about it on the internet really, but it's uh, one of our biggest movies for next year. It's coming at the at the end of next year as our big Christmas movie, and it's the same animation studio and producer behind Despicable Me uh, and the Minions movie. Uh, and this one is uh, about a bunch of Hang on, I'm trying to think of like what I can and can't say. Um, it's a very music-driven movie. It's about a bunch of characters who basically end up like kind of in a talent show, like an American Idol type singing competition. And, and we're is using there a possibility a of a music supervisor named JoJo involved. Yeah, JoJo yeah. Villanueva. Who uh, did you guys meet JoJo? Yeah, did he week. come speak to you guys? Last week. He's a character. So we did Straight Outta Compton together, and um, and uh, I could. I could tell you some stories about JoJo, but um, so JoJo's also the supervisor that we hired to do a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff on this animation project because it's just it's so music-driven. It's I, right now we're up to like eighty-something songs that we're using. Eight zero. Eighty, yeah, wow. eighty-something songs that we're using because it's just that in every scene somebody's opening their mouth to sing a recognizable song. Um, so, um, so my now in-house, will your staff mm -hmm. clear that? Yeah, this is an this this movie is a kind of an in like an all hands on even though it's an independent supervisor. Sure. So my department how is many, how many members in your department? About twenty five people, and the group the department basically is broken up into four main groups. There's m me and the creative. I mean, it's me and everyone, I guess. But it's there's the creative slash production team, which is a handful of people who I have a couple of senior execs who are the day to day point people on all the movies that we make and on. At any given time, I guess we're working on like 20 something movies at once. Um, so, and then there's a, a, a group of people that support them as the day to day creative execs on the movie. So, that's the creative team. Um, I have a, a business affairs team, which is a small handful of people that are lawyers who make our deals and do all the, 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 the legal stuff for the department. I have a licensing team who their job day in, day out is to make the deals for us to license in music from labels and publishers that we use in our in our movies. So existing music, whether it's, I was gonna say happy birthday, although happy birthday may not be a licensing no, not issue anymore. going they forward anymore. They owe me money anymore. actually for a license. Right, anything. sure, so, get my money. you know, whether we're using, you know, a song that someone's singing in a movie or a needle drop, which is, you know, a song playing in the background of a bar or whatever, or we're, you know, any permutation of using an existing song, that's, that those deals are made by the licensing team. And then I have a handful of people who oversee our publishing um, interests, which is the management of our catalog of music, which is, even though I told you I don't work on TV, I oversee the publishing catalog, which is about 100 years worth of music. And all the scores for all the films all and the songs you might have produced, All the music right? we own from all the film, and it's about half and half film and TV. Okay. So, I, so to, re to, to recap, create, the, the creative and production group, licensing, business affairs and publishing, and that makes up the whole department. Right. So my day today started with a, a call with the filmmakers on the animated movie. The, our animation studio actually happens to be in Paris, so we do a lot of early mo morning phone calls with Paris. So I started at eight this morning talking with the filmmaker, the director and producer of the movie in Paris, just reviewing the, la the latest batch. We're actually, there's a, an, an original song in the works for that film, so we've been having a lot of A-list songwriters come in and look at footage, and write a song that will hopefully work in that let's, scene. Let's, so, jump, let's jump off for a second onto that process because yeah. that's a fascinating one. So the derby, as we call it, mm -hmm. to nail one of these huge spots in one of these films which can kick off crazy amounts of revenue over the next decade, century, whatever, right. plus get X amount of exposure, which we've talked about how these songs in films can really do wonders for an artist. And we'll talk about the the weekend, for example, as an example um, when we get to it. But so, what is that process of finding artists and songwriters to try to go for to get these spots? Talk about that. You know, it's second. different. The, 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 doing a derby, meaning like we're going to have a lot of different writers come in and kind of all try to do a song for us on spec, meaning we're not going to like pay anyone up front. But if we pick their song, we'll we'll pay them good money and you know and and work out a really mutually beneficial arrangement of ownership and all of that stuff. So, because we're up against real deadlines on this one, we don't have time to mess around. So rather than invest all in like one songwriter who would like hopefully get it right, we've had about so far maybe a dozen or maybe closer to two dozen at this point writers come in and look at footage and then they go away. We give we we show them the footage, we give them the brief, we tell them what we're looking for. 
and then they go away and come back with the song. And we've gotten a bunch so far, and a lot of them are really good. I don't know that there's any one clear front runner, but in this case, we need a song um, kind of spec, you know, demoed up for us just to get somebody to show it and create a rough version of the song that we can listen to and kind of imagine being produced in a certain way that would suit the sequence in the film. And in this case, the song's gonna be sung in the film by the actor playing a character in an animated film. So um, all of that stuff is laid out for the writers and they're thinking of everything from the creative kind of boxes they have to tick to technical stuff like who the actress is that's gonna be singing the song and sort of writing for her and knowing what her voice sounds like. And then just the sto story-wise, the lyrics need to touch on certain key story points. And it also just needs to be a good song. And then if we're lucky, maybe something that could you know, be covered by, you know, maybe we'd have the film version and then the soundtrack version that maybe could get some radio play. So we're trying to sort of really um, cook up something big on, on a lot of levels. So um right now we're kind of in the middle of the derby and it's and it's a tough thing i mean our job is basically to get a group of people to agree on something really subjective which right. is is this How a good song how many people are in that decision making process to see who gets it who gets that song in the film um there's the director of the movie who he in this case isn't necessarily the most important decision maker right. in the mix but the animated he, is more producers medium right but but his his he opinion is really important he gets a vote so we have the director we have the the local producer in paris who is the sort of maybe more like a line producer, the more kind of in the trenches, day-to-day -day producer. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, sorry, and then um, Chris Melodondri is, the, is, is basically the big producer. He runs the studio, It's yeah. his company and, and, and he's the, the top producer in the mix. So Chris has an opinion, the director has an opinion, the other producer has an opinion. Um, I get a say, Rachel, who's my key creative exec on the project, Jojo is the music supervisor. Um, I'd say that's the core group. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually there's other producers and various kind of people in the mix um, that, that, that all have a say. So, you know. Would it go to as far if, about the artist who covers it to Donna Langley, who runs the studio? Does, um, it, does it get to that level when it. Sometimes. I mean, some, I, with a movie like Fifty Shades, um, you know. It was laid out very early going into Fifty Shades that um, there, were, there were big expectations for the soundtrack and how, um, how important the soundtrack was gonna be to the movie and what people were expecting the soundtrack to add to the movie. So right. in that case, um, it was a very high profile project, a very high stakes project, and a project where the music was gonna be really critical to getting it right and setting the tone and making it credible and taking this small story and making it feel like it had a bigger kind of scale and scope. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... So while we're there, um, let's just stay on so that. that was so actually, that was actually a much bigger right. committee so of decision makers. that was a movie makers. that, for example, me, I heard the record had one of the artists, a new artist, uh, perform at the Guild of Music Supervisors, whose name was... Laura Welsh. Laura Welsh, I thought was great. And so when it came out opening weekend, I went to see it. Yeah. And, I, you know, so that the, the aspect of, you know, using artists like The Weeknd, right, who was basically on a trajectory all the way up, mm -hmm. but that movie took it and made him a mainstream yeah. artist. Yeah. So tell me about that plan and how does someone like that artist come into the play and go to that next level and make a video? I mean, there's a cool, there's this kind of a science that you want to dial in in those situations to like, finding an artist like The Weeknd who is like breaking, like, the, the, you know, a lot of music business people will show up and be like, you know, this is a smash, or this guy's the next big, <laughs> this is the next so-and-so. A lot of hype and, in this business. Right, so a lot so. of hype. So, um, you know, with The Weeknd, there was just a, something about identifying someone who really felt like there was a groundswell of momentum and that he was, a re that he was breaking and that he was real credible and, and authentic and kind of the real deal and that there was something cool and soulful about him and that he would really that he really kind of helped fit our agenda of what we were trying to do by making sexy. by making he was sexy is he's all about sex and vibe things that I don't know you people well enough to we can't say, talk about to, to go into detail but he's got a certain he's, he's for he's got a really rabid loyal fan base and they basically all want to sleep with him so um, he's just he just he just oozes you know this kind of sexuality and it really just um, our director kind of fell in love with him. We actually had uh, one song from him that we were trying in the movie, but, but just getting into business with him a little bit started a relationship where we really then knew we wanted to get him in, more involved and cook up like the big kind of anthem 
for the movie. But, you know, Fifty Shades started even way before that because the first thing that we did on Fifty Shades was cook up the Beyonce thing for a tra working with marketing to cook up the Beyonce cover of Crazy in Love to eventize the trailer. So first that we did that. That was actually her singing a yeah. stripped down version of the song, correct? It was her singing kind of like a sultry, slowed down, sexy version of right. Crazy and in Love. Right, and it definitely in the trailer, I remember seeing the trailer, caught your attention yeah. immediately. Yeah, and we were very careful about what we let people know about that like part of the part of what eventized that is that nobody knew Beyonce was involved and then when the song came out there was a lot of speculation of like is she in the movie is she does she have more stuff on the soundtrack like it just it really kind of fed the fed the beast you know and mm -hmm. and um, and got us off on the right foot where like we, we positioned it really well with like music's gonna really help tell the story of rolling out this movie so you know first we had that we, and I forget, was the song in the movie? Yeah, it was. It was, it, was in a big, it was in a big scene That's in the right, movie. Right. And, and then there was and, actually and the a record, second right? song, a second Beyonce song in the movie as well. Okay. Um, and on the soundtrack. Um, you know, and any, you know, it's sort of easy to like recap it now and be like, we did a Beyonce thing. But like, you know, the business of it was crazy and the yeah. getting her into the studio and all of the, all of, just even getting her to say yes, every one of those things was just crazy amount of like, effort and positioning and negotiating and, and, and all of that. But um, but once we were really in the cutting room with the movie, which was about, you know, this time last year, we were really in the home stretch of putting the movie together. That's when, you know, we had it broken down by like, all right, the opening sequence. At one point we had a Florence and the Machine song in the opening of the movie and we knew we weren't gonna keep that song, but you know, we went out to Florence and said, hey, do you wanna do something? And she said no, cause she had a record coming out. So timing wise, that, that was, you know, that it area. was off with Florence. And then that particular sequence, we ended up going around the world and back and ending up with an Annie Lennox cover of, a, of an old, of um, I Put a Spell on You. And that mm, was the opening right. song. And then we had a sequence where they go on their first date and they're all flying around in his helicopter. And we had something as a placeholder in that sequence that we knew we had to beat. And we went and we, were, we got to a point where we were like, who's the biggest songwriter on the planet that we haven't reached out to yet to do something for Fifty Shades that could nail this song for us. And we went out to Max Martin, who was one of the biggest hit makers on the planet. And we got Max to write a song for that sequence. And then we um, were in business with Republic Records. And one of Republic Records' big artists at the time was, or a breaking artist at the time was Tove Lowe. So Tove Lowe was gonna cut the Max Martin record. And then she ended up getting sick and having a real issue with her vocal cords. So the Tove Lowe deal went away. And we had a, this amazing Max Martin song with nobody to sing it. And then Max basically said, cause a, there was a short list of who he thought could, could sing it. And he said, let's get Ellie Goulding to do it. So we went to Ellie Goulding and she said yes, but she's also on a different record label. So then we had to go to Interscope Records and make a deal for Ellie to come in. And I mean, as I'm saying it, it's like, it's exhausting. So, um, you know, so there were <laughs> that's things- That's what he does every day, ladies and gentlemen. There were things that we made, like the Ellie, the Max Martin song, that was the Ellie Goulding song for that sequence. And then we, the, the, the weekend thing was interesting because I had met, right when we started making Fifty Shades, I was at an event and I got introduced to a guy, like someone was actually trying to get away from him and said to me like, hey Mike, come here, meet this guy. Uh, his name's Stefan, he just wrote Wrecking Ball for Miley Cyrus and then kind of split. And it was, I was like, oh, hi, nice to meet you person who just wrote Wrecking Ball. Um, congratulations, it was right when Wrecking Ball was a big hit. And so we started talking and he said, what are you working on? And I said, we got this Fifty Shades movie. And he was really intrigued by that. And he was a, already a hit songwriter in his own right and had worked with everyone from Celine Dion to Miley Cyrus. And he went away and wrote a song for Fifty Shades that's actually the second end title in the movie with an artist named Skylar Gray. Um, but he, he and I really got into a groove and one thing led to another along the way. He started working at The Weeknd. He and The Weeknd went away and wrote Earned It and then brought that back to us as the end title song. And so it's just, you know, all the twists and turns that it took to cook up Earned It, and I'm shortening a lot of these stories, but oh. Earned It as the, as the end title song that also has a short play in the body of the film. Ellie Goulding with the song in that sequence. And then we went with some catalog stuff. There's a Frank Sinatra tune that they danced to in a scene. There's um, a Rolling Stones song that we dropped into a, a kind of morning after their big hookup. So you had quite the music budget on this film, did you? We spent a lot of money on music. Yeah, so quick sidebar and Stefan, the other night you remember uh, after JoJo, I cut it short because I had to go to this Taylor Swift event at the Grammy Museum. And as mm -hmm. I'm waiting to get the picture with Taylor at the end, I run into Maddie Noyes, who's a new right. singer-songwriter, who Stefan is now working with right. and producing the record. And he, so we literally, last Monday night, 
or last Wednesday night, I met him and had a great hang with him. He's a great guy. Yeah, no, he's a great Canadian guy, fella. and that's a that's a right now. Maddie Noyes is kind of like where Weekend was. She actually did a she did a part on a new Weekend track on his record yes. because of Stefan Macchio. Right. So so we've got our eye on her. I don't know if you guys know. Do you guys know who Maddie Noyes is? Probably not. No, she's um, under the radar. But, but she's, she's coming. She's coming. She, she's coming. And um, do you know who um, Halsey is? Right. So Halsey is sort of like where Maddie Noyes will be in a minute, and then Halsey will blow up to the next level, and Maddie Noyes will get to the level where Halsey is now. So as I'm working on movies that go into releases for 2016, 2017, 2018, um, we're trying to sort of you know have our eye on right. who who's in the pipeline as the next big breaking so, right. artist so that would add value to our movies. A big part of this gig is the A and R aspect of being able to project forward and say, okay, my movie's coming a year from now. Who's going to be there in a year? And like I said, it's hard because the labels pitch, oh, this guy's going to be a star, this guy's going to be a star. And it's really yeah. Mike's job and his people's job to really weed through and say, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Because yeah. a lot of it's about the song. I mean, I will say this. First and foremost, our job is to help this company and the filmmakers we're in business with make great movies, mm -hmm. right? It all starts with the movie up on the screen. So that's our that's 99% of what we do and our absolute number one priority is let's make a great movie. The stuff that we spend a lot of time on here in the music department, like soundtracks and you know TV commercials and online music videos and all of that stuff, that's all ancillary stuff, but it all still rolls up into making and selling a great movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have different agendas and different priorities depending on which mode we're in. Usually the mode we're in is making movies. If marketing calls and says, help us make a trailer, you know, we want to eventize this trailer for Fifty Shades or Pitch Perfect or Jurassic or, you know, the next Snow White and the Huntsman movie, which is one of the ones we have in the pipeline now where on the you last Florence song, we did you? Yeah, Florence came in on the first movie and made it's a song. Hunts, Huntsman, right? Yeah, well, the first one was Snow White and the Huntsman. So now we're doing The Huntsman, which is the sequel. So we will soon be maybe going out to somebody like Halsey, let's say, for example. But the tough part when we're in that mode is we want to be able to run over to marketing and like kick down their door and be like, guess who we got to do a song for The Huntsman movie? And they go, you know, who? And we go, you know, Halsey. And if half the people in the room, or if all the people in the room go, well, who the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, then it's like, oh, no, no, you know, you remember, you might have heard that song, or she was, you, she's going to be a big thing. You know, it's like as soon as you have to start explaining who it is, then you're kind of in trouble if what they're looking for, like there's one person in marketing who cuts trailers in the creative group over there. If she could put songs by the same short list of artists in every trailer she would and those artists are like eminem jay-z kanye rihanna and right because they have the energy wait, wait, that they there's need. one other one beyonce acdc eminem jay-z kanye rihanna and beyonce i guess that's those five they right. would be the artists in like every trailer for every movie sure in any genre and it's like you know, those artists get asked to do a lot of stuff. Sometimes that works out, like we did a Beyonce thing on a movie. Um, but they also get pitched things all the time. They say no to a lot of stuff. They're really expensive, those artists. I mean, mm -hmm. there's artists like, you know, you know, Mumford and Sons. They get hit up for trailers and, and movie stuff all the time. Um, and we had a situation with Mumford and Sons last year where there was like no amount of money that could get them to say yes to just licensing us an existing song to use in one of our trailers. They, they just, just weren't interested. We're not interested. They saw well, the movie, they loved the movie, they hit it off with the director, they just like, they, they kind of said yes, 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 every, every step along the way, and then it was like, so, can we use your song? They were like, mm, no. Right, so there's that crazy thing where sometimes artists, for whatever reason, just don't want to do things. And film people and studios can't understand it. Mike is a music guy, so he understands it. But there is that fine line of just going, no, you know, and yeah. then people will just keep writing checks. I understand it, but I still pull my hair out if I'm standing in front of a band, like I did with this one band, with and literally had permission from the company to say to them, I will write you a check right now for a million dollars. All you have to do is say yes and let us use your song. Like... That's all, all they, they didn't have to go into the studio, they didn't have to record, they didn't have wow. to write, like just a, mi a million dollars. What do they call that, integrity or stupidity? I'm not sure, somewhere in between. I don't know, I'm, I am confident that one day, like years from now, they'll be sitting around going like, did we say no to a million dollars when that guy walked up to us? But for, for the moment, they, they you know, it's, it's, all right. it's all working so out. So yeah, we're backtracking. So we got the animated feature, what else were you working on today? Uh, I went to a meeting where the uh, main creative team at the studio was talking about the slate and movies in the pipeline and 
What do we need meeting? for yeah production How meeting? How often do you production meetings weekly? every week? Yeah, right. What other week meetings do you attend every week? On the company, a lot of meetings, too right. many meetings. It's That's politics. When right? people yeah. say, "What do you do for a living?" I go to meetings go to and meetings. answer emails. But do you go to marketing meetings? Um, marketing meetings, regular. Production I mean, meetings. everything is pretty much weekly. Marketing meetings, production meetings, physical production meetings, where we talk about kind of nuts and bolts, schedules and deadlines and boring stuff, basically. Um, I have a very small meeting at the end of each week with my boss, who's the chair of the studio, with my counterparts, like just me, the head of physical production, the head of post-production, the head of visual effects, where we just department, kind of... It's a department head meeting. A department head meeting where we get into a very small room and talk about stuff that we don't really talk about in the bigger room. Sure. Um, and then how often do you meet with your staff? Uh, uh, every week. I have a staff meeting in this room where we're sitting, where John, I don't know if he told you, he broke, I, I won an award <laughs> a couple years ago that's on the table behind us. And the first thing McHugh did when he came in to set up for this is he promptly, he knocked it over and broke it. So, um, so the good news yeah. is, oh, yeah. look at that. The good news is I am a secretary of the organization. So I actually know people and can get it replaced. The bad news is I did break it. Yeah, yeah, so um, <laughs> how, how did that come up? Um, uh, Oh, so, so in this room, we have a staff meeting once a week where I, all the people that I told you about, business affairs, licensing, publishing, and creative, we get in here and we, we, have, a, we have a production guide and we go page by page by page and talk about open, time-sensitive issues on every movie. Okay. And it makes my brain hurt right. all so the time. So how many meetings do you average a day? Too many. I mean, like, like a handful. Four, I have, three, I mean, four? They vary. Sometimes we have very corporate meetings where, like the ones I just described, mm -hmm. we have meetings where we have artists come in and just do general meetings where, like, you know, Justin Timberlake's in town and, you know, is interested, you know, Jason Mraz came in last week. He was just, he was in L.A. He lives in San Diego, but he was in L.A. for the day and wanted to meet with some people and just talk about, like, movie stuff that he may or may not want to get involved in. So he came in and we shot the shit and we talked about projects and... He walked out spinning his wheels about whether that or any of that sounded interesting, interesting to him. And then the cool thing is maybe something will come up tomorrow where we'll be like, oh, shit, you know who was just here? Jason Mraz. Let's talk more. Let's go back to him and see if he wants to do this. Right, top of mind awareness. Um, so sometimes we meet with artists, composers, agents, managers, label people. There's, there's each label pretty much has like a dedicated soundtrack person that's always on the prowl for what can they partner up with us on and, and, and what can we do together. So um, it's sort of, we just try to keep it balanced. I want to keep the projects on track. Um, keep, I want to stay in, I want to keep my department well connected with our counterparts and the other groups and mm -hmm. stay on top of production issues. Of the 20 something movies that I mentioned are in, you know, that we're tracking at any given time, some of them are in pre production, some of them are in production, some of them are in post production. So, you know, we just want to stay on top of all of those things and do what we do at any given stage of, you know, those movies when we're working on them. So, and one of the questions I got <clears throat> from the students was, um, what do you look for when you hire a music supervisor? I mean, <sighs> We, we work in a really small community in a really small corner of the business. Everybody knows everybody, right? So, you know, we all know who, like, the A-list, who the best music supervisors are. And being the best music supervisor doesn't necessarily mean someone who's got, who can, like, pick the best songs, you know? It's like, if only the job were that easy and cool, where we just sat around listening to music going, like, I like this song, let's put it in this scene. There's a little bit of that in the day-to-day -day of being a music supervisor, but there's a lot of business, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of finessing. So I think it all rolls up into being someone who's solution-oriented and who just understands the dynamic of being part of a team and having multiple bosses and um, keeping things on track, um, respecting the boundaries of the budget, being mindful of the deadlines on the schedule. So it's like, we just have to, it's, it's really simple if you distill it down to, you know, getting the movies done on schedule, on budget, and with the best possible realization of the studio and the filmmaker's vision of the movie that we're making. That's a really, that all represents a really complicated bunch sure. of stuff. It's a matrix of things. Right, but it's sort of like a director might jump up and down going like, this is the best scene for that sequence, but... The company that's paying for the movie may not agree, right? So I can't, I, we, we have to kind of keep it balanced. Like, are the filmmakers happy? Great. Is the studio happy? Great. You know, we had a thing on Fast and Fear. One of the, if you guys watched The Real well, while it was playing, you know, we had this song this year called See You Again by Charlie Puth and Wiz Khalifa. Have you guys all heard of Charlie Puth? 
Some heads are nodding. Have you heard of Charlie Puth before Fast and Furious 7 and See You Again? No, right? So, you know, where we sit, that, that did a lot for, for, for Charlie's career. Charlie wrote the song. Again, there was a derby for that very important sequence at the end at the end of Furious Seven, which is essentially the Paul Walker kind of memorial tribute sequence, um, which is a very rare thing. It doesn't that's you know it's a very rare and unique thing to work on a sequence like that where we're going to make a song that's going to commemorate a guy that we lost. That's also telling a story in a film, but there's the real life story behind it. It's a very difficult yeah, assignment, right? Complex so place. we did a derby on that as well, and we collected a lot of songs that were submitted. Charlie's was the one that we kept coming back to. Somewhere along the way, I'm sure we said, who the fuck is Charlie Puth, right? You know, he's just, he was this new kid. I think his pedigree at the time was like, he was kind of a YouTube sensation who'd been on the Ellen show a, a handful of times, but he, but he got signed by a major, you know, force in the publishing business, and um, he wrote this great hook of a song that really kind of, when we were making that movie, was this, it was the song we kept coming back to. But then it was time, once we decided, like, this is the song we're using for this sequence, all right, who's singing, who's the demo singer? Well, the demo singer was Charlie. Well, how are we gonna construct it? Well, let's do like kind of a rap ballad. Let's get someone like Wiz Khalifa, or Wiz Khalifa, to do the verses, and then let's get someone big for the melodic hook. Well, it turned out that um, Wiz Khalifa made sense because he had done a, a song for us as like kind of the anthem for Fast and Furious 6. So it made sense to bring him back for 7. As far as like the casting of him, it was like, you know, putting guys on um, the songs for a Fast and Furious movie is like almost like we're casting auxiliary cast members. Sure. So then we said, well, let, you know, Charlie sounds great. Let's keep Charlie. Hey, producer, director, studio executives, and everybody who has a say in this, Vin Diesel and you know, how do you like this? And there was a lot of, you know, who the fuck is Charlie Puth? Right. Right? Who can we get that's better? Problem is, Charlie wrote the song. And Charlie so now Charlie has, song. Charlie has reps basically saying, um, yeah, you can't take Charlie off this song. And then I have filmmakers saying, like, we got to get someone bigger. We just pulled up pictures of Charlie Puth online. He looks like the last thing that of someone we'd cast in this movie. It's like we're casting somebody to, right. to play this part, you know? And no, it, you know, no disrespect to Charlie, but let's get... Some. So there was just those kinds of things, and obviously you know how it, how it worked out, but we went around the world and back with other people trying it. I mean, if you Google it, I, I'm not telling any secrets. There's stuff online of leaked tracks of, you know, I think somebody just leaked the... Chris Brown was, tried singing it at one point, and, and uh, Trey songs, and um, and we ultimately came full circle back to Charlie, not because of business stuff, but because Charlie actually ended up sounding the best on the track, and it was a bit of a risk on our part to basically go with Wiz Khalifa and this kind of unknown kid to do arguably the biggest, most important song of anything we, we've done all year, if not ever. Right, and the interesting point of that is if Charlie Puth didn't have the reps that he had, he might have gotten pushed off that song and been had to make that decision. Do I want to have a huge song in a huge movie and not be part of it? Yeah. Or let it go to Chris Brown or somebody bigger? And so the reps obviously make sure that they want to break the artist. It's very hard to break an artist. Mike has an incredible platform with his movie to help break an artist. So they push that button. And Mike has to say, all right, well, we do want this song, so we have to use this guy, even though he wouldn't be our first choice. It's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Do you, I'm curious, before we run out of time, do you guys have, I, I don't, uh, it's your class, so you can run it out of your own. Yeah. I'm curious if they have questions and yeah, want to questions. talk about anything in particular. They got questions. You guys have uh, some questions you want to launch at Mike before I uh, keep going? I need hands and I need them loud. <laughs> Or not, we can just keep talking at you. Go ahead, Katie. Uh, let's play back to the very beginning. But one thing that um, everybody, the different music supervisors who have come and spoken with us, um, obviously they all talk a lot about collaboration, but how do you find, um, I guess, how much creativity can you have when you have so many different interests competing against each other? So where, where do you find that balance, I guess? Uh, yeah, it's really hard. I mean, you know, the, the, I think getting involved in a project early and often and kind of working with the director so that they understand, like, we're not the police. 
we're not the bad like studio executive like the suits who are going to kind of be spying on them or have an agenda that's going to undermine theirs and so i think um you know it's definitely tricky to be just purely creative without factoring in business considerations um because we also know what's expensive versus what's realistically gettable. Every movie has its own budget, you know, so we happen to be having a great year at Universal, but just because we made a ton of money on one movie doesn't mean that we don't have to respect this other project's music budget. So, you know, I, right now I'm working on a $17 million movie that's very aggressively budgeted, and then I'm also working on a $180 million movie that has more to spend on music. So, um, it's, it's a little bit of everything. I mean, I, you know, I think the creative hopefully is a big driver in, in let's, just, let's just swing for the fences and kind of like do a kind of blue sky approach to like if we could cook up anything that would be amazing, like let's do that. And then if, if that works out, great. If it turns out that that's a, that's a, those are amazing ideas but they are not gettable or because artists say no or we don't have the money to pursue something like that, then how close can we get? So. In my job, I don't get to unilaterally just dictate to a filmmaker, here, uh, you know, I like this artist The Weeknd, let's put his song in the movie and then, you know, problem solved. But, um, you know, I can certainly, I think people respond to passion. If someone's really passionate about an idea, I mean, I'm just as receptive to it as I, as I am, you know, uh, careful about putting it out myself. So I might have an idea that I think is genius. If no one agrees with me, at some point I gotta give up on that. Very few things are worth kind of like, you know, throwing yourself on your sword for and kind of saying like, there's no other idea but mine. This is the greatest idea. You're crazy for not agreeing with me. So there is a finesse, there's a negotiation, and there's definitely a politic to, you know, um, dealing in the subjective and creative realm about music and what good music is and what's not good music. So um, it's true. I don't know. If I totally forgot your question. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's... No, yeah. And, you know, another thing collaborations-wise, you know, Mike and I, a couple of years ago when he had Fast Five, I had a, produ a producer that I represent that I brought mm. in. Uh, Mike and his right hand, creative person, Rachel, really liked his work. He did a couple of demos for them. And then it came time for Fast Five and Titles, and they wanted to do a remake of Don Omar and add a rapper to it. So we were working on Rick Ross, because mm -hmm. I was at Island Def Jam at the time, and... You know, that didn't come to fruition, and we ended up with Buster Rhymes and Don Omar, and it was a tremendous track. Yeah, it was a great and track. And so that collaborative process of, and again, I think he probably did like 10 different incarnations of it to get it to stick. Yeah. So, and let's go back to that. Use that as an example of Pharrell on Happy, <laughs> because that's an example of Mike, you know, when Mike, I went to the premiere of the movie, and, you know, the song was great, but you just, it didn't, have you know it's interesting when a record before it becomes a hit people say oh i can know a hit when yeah. you hear it so talk about that process of working with someone like pharrell who's a huge star with a big ego and that process of how that song came together yeah. and what that takes wait i mean to be fair pharrell is actually a very like collaborative guy and he i mean he certainly is entitled to a big ego but he he's it's not a you bad know, thing he's you know. well, he's all in on a project happy was a tricky one because i don't know if you guys saw despicable me but there's a sequence in the movie where the main figure, who's sort of the hero slash villain of the movie, he just wakes up one day, realizes he's in love with a girl, and he's happy. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it seems obvious now in hindsight, but he, like, he makes breakfast for his kids, and he's happy doing that, and he's walking down the street, and there's some street musicians, and he joins in, and he's happy doing that, and he walks through the park, and he throws fris a frisbee to some, and he's just, it's a, it's a very basic sequence in a movie about a guy being happy. Um, we knew very early on in the process of making Despicable Me 2 that we that was going to be a spot where Pharrell was going to do a song. And like we had done with other spots in the movie, that was given to him as an assignment. Here's what's going on. We showed him a rough sequence. Um, come back and give us a song that works in a sequence where the guy, where Gru, the character Gru, Steve Gurrell's character, is happy. And Pharrell, over a series of many months, turned in song after song after song and none of them work. Sometimes his music is very like kind of left to center and not as pop or, in, or, or not as accessible. And so he kind of turned up initially with sort of like a couple of weird songs and then just things that, you know, one thing after another that kind of didn't really work. And it got really tense. We got really down to the wire. We were up against our deadlines. 
song after song, he wasn't getting it, he wasn't nailing it, and then that's when I have the very kind of unpleasant job of having the filmmakers come to me kind of freaking out, going like, you got to explain it to Pharrell, and you got to tell him if we don't have a song by this date, like, should we start looking for other songs? Should we go license, like, some existing, let's go get Walking on Sunshine, or one of those, like, very cheesy, stereotypical, like, songs you see in a movie in a sequence where someone's being happy. So um, I had to get Pharrell on the phone and basically say, listen, you got, like, one more shot. Here's what this needs to be. I, and I'll answer any question you have about what it would take for this to be right. We can talk about technical stuff like tempo, chord progressions. We can talk about lyrics. We can talk about other songs that are good examples of references that maybe would work here. And um, he had to go away and dig deep and kind of wipe the slate clean and sort of hit the reset button and hunker down and be like, all right, I need to write a song about a dude being happy. And he came back with the song Happy. And... I think we'd been through such a process that it wasn't like an instant like, oh my God, this is the most, this song's gonna become a cultural phenomenon. It was like, all right, wait a second. This one could work. Let's try it. Let's send it to, the, to Paris. Let's have them cut it in. Let's kind of tweak the sequence a little bit and see if we can shape it to this song. And like, we would kind of study it over and over and be like, you know what? This one might work. This might be the one. This could be it. And, um, and it, when we made an investment, like that's the one, let's finish it. Um, let's, let's put it in the film. And uh, yeah, the movie came out at the top of that summer, summer of 2013. And uh, the movie was a big hit, but that was also the summer of Get Lucky and Blurred Lines. So the radio, radio was being dominated by two other Pharrell songs. We made a decision to kind of hold back. And the movie was a big enough hit that like nobody was begging us to like, you got to get a song on the radio to help, you know, get the movie to sell movie tickets, which sometimes happens. But in this case, it was like Despicable Me Too was doing fine without radio play from a single. So the movie came and went at the box office. The summer of Get Lucky and Blurred Lines kind of came and went. And then we found ourselves in the fall of that year, two years ago. And all of a sudden it started feeling like there were people the people were still reacting to happy and we went to pharrell's label at the time we had the soundtrack we had the rights to the soundtrack here on our own label and we're working it ourselves but i started talking to a guy named ashley newton who is leaving columbia records but was the head of columbia records and the guy who signed pharrell and um we kind of agreed to like let's partner up and work happy like let's try to really push happy out there in a way that it hadn't yet been realized as a standalone single and um, you know, and then it just it's, it just blew Smash. up. Smash! It blew up. Smash. So um, yeah, you know, it's so, just, they all every yeah. one of these and has like a whole story behind great, it. There are always great stories to the whole back and forth of what it takes to get things to the screen and what almost happened and didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other questions for you. One is um, as far as the licensing aspect, how's the decline of the music business since the early two thousands decreased or increased the average licensing rates? In other words, has the business, the pressure on yeah, the labels, mm -hmm. how have you guys been with them and them with you in the back and forth I mean, of it all? I think, I think there's probably a palpable kind of increased pressure at labels and publishers to get more money from guys like me mm -hmm. to help make their numbers, right? Like, that's just, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's obvious because... They're make they're not selling records the way they used to. You know the, pub, you know mechanical income for publishers, which you can talk about in another class, isn't what it used to be. Um, so yeah, I think licensing as a column of revenue for labels and publishers, there's clearly more pressure than ever before for those guys to jack up their prices and make as much money as they can off of guys like me. Which if any of them were sitting here in this room, they would say, no, we don't jack up our price. But I, I think but well, the, the, flip side of, the flip side of that is that in 2015 is we're under pressure to keep our budgets as clamped down as possible, too. So we're not just sitting here writing big checks and throwing money around. So we're trying to make shrewd deals. We're, we are, if, you, if, you, we, if we were to break it down, it's pretty obvious to us that we are paying out a ton of money, millions of dollars a year, to probably the same few major publishers and major, major labels on a really consistent basis, probably 90% of the money that we spend to license music for our films and our trailers, and then for that matter at the company for our TV shows as well, 90-something um, percent of it's probably going to you know, less than a dozen different companies out mm -hmm. there, right? So 
we're, we, we pay attention to who's getting more of our money and, and when that comes, when we want to sort of push for either a volume discount or we want to bring it to their attention of like, hey, you don't want to cut us a deal on this song? We've written you, even on this one project or this year or in the last few years, here's how much money, like we're paying attention to that all the time. Sure. They're paying attention to it as well. But, you know, I respect that their job is to bring in as much money as they can for licensing out their music. Mm -hmm. I, I have that function as a publisher as well. I mean, as, as a co-owner of Happy, I am, I'm a publisher and, our, and a master owner. So I'm licensing out Happy to, you know, we had a huge use in a, in a um, acne medication commercial where some people are just walking down the street looking happy because they don't have pimples on their face anymore. We licensed that song out and for, for a lot of money, but that's, you know, that's part of our gig. The main part of our gig of licensing music into our films, um, you know, that's, that's, that's our business and we're the guardians and gatekeepers of, of that budget, of that money. The same way the labels and the publishers, their job is to get as much of our money right, as they so we can. So we've got two more minutes, so two more questions. So one is the publishing outtake. You sending your music out there in the world, licensing it out. Is that number that you, the, the revenue that pull in, is that um, held accountable against the budget you spend on films? Or are they two separate Two separate budgets? things. And two separate things. totally differently. I mean, the money that we make from publishing, if, if I get, you know, if See You Again generates a million dollars in publishing income. When that money comes in, it gets booked to that pro to Fast and Furious 7. So it does. They, they each it, go to their right. own revenue stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know, but you know, the, the the publishing catalog, whether it's from licensing things out or performance income, it generates tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue for this company. Sure. If I was just a music company, that'd be really awesome. Right. I work at Comcast NBC Universal where my tens of millions of dollars. I mean, the company. I think it's in the in the news. Uh, I mean, it is in the news, but I think it's easy to look up. I think we're up to we, we, somewhere between five and six billion dollars that we've made so far this year. So for me to run around going like I made ten million dollars from you know, it's like it doesn't. It's like lunch money. <laughs> you are the to, tail to, of the dog to a friend. company that's you know that's raking in right. literally billions and last of question dollars. Before we let you go, because it's almost six thirty. Um, what is the most frustrating? part of your job. You talked about the happy parts and the great parts. What is the toughest one for you to handle and balance? I think the hardest part is just the not enough hours in a day to get it all done. I'd love to give every one of these projects 100% of my undivided attention. Um, so the, the, the balancing act, the, the juggling routine and the balancing act of making people feel like they always have 100% of my right. undivided attention, building a team so that nothing falls through the cracks and that between me and the team, the project is being 100% taken care of, but I have to run a department, deal with corporate stuff, deal with department stuff, um, and try to divide my time between all those projects. So it's just days and weeks and months, just time flies by, and I just, you know, it's, I can't get it all in. And so how's just, that it's balancing, a, it's a balancing act with act. your family? Because you have a beautiful wife and two, hmm. two boys, right? Yeah, no, I have a boy and a girl. Boy and a girl, sorry. And so talk about that, trying to keep a job like it's this. It's just life, it's just hard, you know? it's. Um, you don't bite off more than you can chew. I don't have too many extracurriculars. You know, John is, was instrumental in getting me involved in the Grammys. And so my main, I have work and, well actually in this order, I have family and work. And then my extracurriculars are basically like the Grammys that get some of my free time. And then I'm, I'm, I still stay very involved in my alma mater at Northwestern and I'm on the Dean's advisory committee there. So um, occasionally I'm involved in Northwestern stuff. And that's like, that's pretty much all I can manage. Right. Well, that's good. Family work, uh, Grammys in Northwest. All right, well, 631. I told him he'd be out of here at 631. So give it up for Mike Knobloch, everybody. Thanks, guys.